the gentle light that falls around me you're the first thought on my mind let our voices rise all creation cries singing out an endless alleluia from this moment on join with heaven's song Welcome back to worship with us here today in the basement service. We're so grateful to have you, whether you're watching from your living room, your kitchen, if you're listening while you're driving in your car, thank you for being a part of, of the body of Christ gathered together. If you'll please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to worship you together. We ask that you open our hearts and open our minds to all that you have to share with us today. God, help us to, to grow closer to you in all that we say and all that we do. And God, we, we ask for those of us who are, who are hurt, who are sick, who are grieving, who are lonely or lost, that you just lift them up today and, and show them your comfort, your love, and your peace that passes all understanding. God, we thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Today is a very special service for two very big reasons. First is, this is the last Sunday ever that Andy will be with us. Aww. Do you have any goodbye words? I, plenty. Um, it just, it, being part of like the creation of the service has been like a joyous experience. It's been a lot of fun. Being able to do things in the way that I think like church should actually be done, and trying to um, like evolve it, take it that next step. Um, and I'm going to be sad to be going, but I uh, think that we've grown a lot here, and that uh, I look forward to seeing the growth that comes with furthering the service and furthering our pursuit of a better understanding of God. Absolutely, and we'd like to say thank you because this. Wouldn't have gotten off the ground without you, that's for sure. And yeah. he put it, or you put your heart and soul into this. And I hope I speak for everyone when I say thank you so much and you will be missed. But as one goes away, another comes forward. Gabe, would you like to introduce yourself today? And Hi, what everyone. You're doing? I'm Gabe. I'm the intern. So I'll be working with the youth ministry this summer and whatever John Engler wants me to do. So if you see... <laughs> A big old six foot three dude walking around. Don't be alarmed. I'm a nice guy. Come say hi. We have some good conversations. So I'm excited to see what the summer holds. Yeah, and we're excited to have you, even though you've been stuck with a lot of the, the paperwork fun stuff. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, we'll, you'll get more involved with VBS coming in. And yeah, yeah. So go and say hi to, to Gabe at VBS. Yeah, I'll be running games. So let's Which go. is the best part, let's be honest. I uh, didn't say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So our scripture lesson today comes from Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 28. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Billa and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made him an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father had loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, 
I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing in the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers, and with the flock, and bring back word to me. Then he sent him off to the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where, the, where they are grazing their flocks? They've moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Do Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishlamites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balms, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to, said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishlamites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of sil silver to the Ishlamites who took him to Egypt. It's a very long story. And it is also not even close to the end of the story. Right, we know Joseph from my fa one of my favorite musicals back in the day, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. But Joseph's story is sort of the extension of all of these other stories, right? So we have Abraham, who then has Isaac, and Isaac then has Jacob and Esau, and Jacob wins over favor from Esau, even though Esau is older, and then Jacob has the, all these sons, and one of them is Joseph. So it's kind of cool how, like, these stories, especially in Genesis, they, they all connect. And I think it's a great way to start off our, our topic about stories and the stories that we, we share with each other and how they all work together to tell God's story. So how exactly in this story did Joseph's brothers react to the dreams that Joseph had? Well, I think... <clears throat> In particular, that the scripture mentions that they react poorly. I yeah. mean, they react negatively. It's it's uh, the, you're told that you, your brother, who you know you may not have the most favor for already, because yep. you know they're your brother, and there's this whole brotherly love. And he tattled. Don't forget <laughs> that it, yeah, it starts it off with tattle. him tattling. Um, but basically, it's the disliked brother of, of the flock of brothers, and it's like. We, we see you as, like, the least of us, and you're telling us that someday we're going we're gonna to bow down to you? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, that's just kind of unheard of. It's this, you know, showing... They reacted poorly. It's not... It's, it's, it's a negative light. It's a... I, I, I know me and my brother don't have the best relations, and if he were to come to me and tell me that, I mean, he'd be on the ground faster than I was, um, <laughs> mostly just from, you know, physical fighting. Um, <laughs> that's how we show our love. <laughs> uh, but Maybe I would never sell him as a slave. <laughs> like, that's what I'm saying. Um, 
it's time for you to go now, Andy. No. Yeah, no, it's, we're getting to that point already. <laughs> but yeah, Gabe, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would say they obviously reacted poorly, but also kind of like the broader context of the ancient Near East. Mm -hmm. The youngest sibling was the least overlooked. They could care less. And so not only is that obviously seen in these brothers, but as a whole in the region and the time, mm -hmm. the youngest sibling nobody cared for. Yep. And I think that was even a bigger uh, insult to his older brothers about mm -hmm. his dreams. Because mm -hmm. you know, the youngest sibling was always looked down upon. There was never even considered. I mean, obviously we see King David, who was the youngest sibling. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, you know, God calls him and he raises up. So it's just unheard of. But then, yeah, it's just the ancient Near East culture. And yeah, I know my older brother would not <laughs> take too kindly to me trying to step up one on him. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. yeah, plenty of screaming matches. Well, yeah. and uh, I, 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 I love what you said because it, it's very much so contextual. It's sort of like, the closest I can think of today is, is their culture, you know, when we look at the queen over in England, you know, the whole thing with having kids is like, you got to have heir and a spare, and then everyone else is just kind of yes. there. <laughs> that, you, you've heard that phrase, right? No. Heir and a spare? No? Okay, well, then that's just me. Um, but yeah, it's, the, it's this idea that he was so far down the line, Andy will recover at some point, he's so far down the line that there's no way that he's going to get anything really, right? So for him to be the favorite then of his dad is also insulting, which it's kind of this generational problem because Jacob also was the younger sibling who then stole favor from his dad. And I think there's, there's some generational stuff that's happening as well. And it's pretty, um, yeah, I, I even look, uh, you know, I have two younger siblings and one older and my youngest brother still to this day, I love you, Sam. If I say, go get me a pop, <laughs> He will go get me a pop because that's the way it works. But my sister always fought that, like tooth and nail, rightfully so. I know, I mean, but <laughs> like we we also had a rule in our family: the oldest sits up front, right? I don't know why that was our rule, but my sister would always insist on taking it from me, and I'm like, oh, follow age order. So mm -hmm. I kind of get it. I'm rude. See, I like age order. We always had that rule when my brother was the oldest because he was like seven foot. Um, so yeah, it made sense for him to be in the front. Uh, but then now the little sister gets the front seat instead of, but. Oh, see, no, still I, I demand the front seat. <laughs> I mean. I don't yeah, know. we never had that. It was always whoever called shotgun first or whoever got <laughs> literally beat out of the front seat. <laughs> and I'm the middle child, so it's like, I mean, I have my older brother, my younger sister, she doesn't take crap from anybody. Mm -hmm. So I can't really boss her around because she's really feisty. And I don't, I don't want that battle. Mm -hmm. like, That's fair. I'll just stay back and you know, yeah. her do her own thing. <laughs> so, so I think it's kind of easy for all of us to understand that sibling dynamics of if someone came to you and was like, I'm going to be ruling in all of you. That's not going over very well. No. No. So what, what exactly do you think was really that scared them? Was it just this concept of uh, their brother thinking he was better than them? Or do you think that part of them was a little bit worried that because Jacob favored him that it actually could happen? Well, think, yeah. Yeah, there was definitely a fear of it could happen. Um, there's a lot, a lot to fear, especially when it comes to like that kind of thing. Because... It, in particular with like how they would be uh, during this time, um, this family would be somebody that would have uh, the more monetary power mm -hmm. with a flock their size, with the, all of this. And so like, especially if you're the oldest brother in particular, you're set to inherit um, like all of this land, all of the flock, all of the, um, but then for the youngest brother to be like, I'm taking it all from you. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be scary. Absolutely. Well, then there's also kind of like a correlation with like this and almost like the par parable of the prodigal son in mm -hmm. a way. Like you're talking about like inheritance and how the older brother at the end of that is all mad at mm -hmm. his dad for allowing that to happen. You kind of see this with, you know, Israel's sons. You know, they don't want, they don't, there's no way in heck their younger brother is taking everything from yep. them. Mm -hmm. And this could also be like a, a culture changing shift and, 
you know, obviously we're humans, we don't like change. And so some people get so caught up in tradition and mm-hmm. cultural norms that they don't want them to dissipate. So I think that was another fear. Like they don't want the world flipped up on its head. Yeah, absolutely. The, the younger siblings ruling or having more authority or power than the older siblings. Well, and I think it's, it's kind of funny because Reuben, the one who sticks up for him, I believe was the oldest. So he's like the only one who actually is kind of like, man, maybe we shouldn't do this. And the, the, the strangest part is like we read this story and the brothers are clearly like not in the right from, from our mm-hmm. cultural perspectives, right? And I hope from theirs as well. But these are the people that then go on to be the 12 tribes of Israel are named after these people. Mm-hmm. Like to be they're, they're part of this bigger, broader story of, of redemption and of bringing about God's love and mercy into the world. And it's kind of interesting when you go down into their stories to realize they were kind of messed up. <laughs> like, and particularly um, this story of Joseph, you know, to have this dream and then immediately your brothers do this terrible thing to you, right? You would have to think at some point you start doubting that dream, right? That at some point you're like, okay, God, clearly there's an issue here. And, and that's not what's actually going on. So how do you think he might have felt as he had predicted like that favor for himself, but then all of a sudden he's being sold to these Ishmaelites? Oh, his ego is depleted. Oh, I would imagine. I mean, you're on top of the world one second, mm-hmm. then you're in a caravan heading down to Egypt, and now you feel like you're completely like the least of these. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, he definitely, <laughs> definitely was having some doubts. Yeah, I would think so. I, I must want to say, I would like to say that I don't know if he was having mm-hmm. doubts. Um, Why is that? And I think that's because of the second dream. Mm-hmm. Or the, the reoccurring dreams that, like, we see from Jacob and, um, like, er, sorry, Joseph. Joseph. My bad. It's his dad. Yeah, They're both it, J names. Uh, J's. Um, but, like, when you see this and, like, repetition becomes part of it. Mm-hmm. And when some, like, an idea keeps getting presented to you, um, and especially something as powerful as this, uh, and something that has, like, such direct meaning, like, you may fear at some point when it may happen. Mm-hmm. But especially, like, when it comes to God and the relationship that we see between, um, like, all of the people that are in the beginning of the Bible and God, like, there is this, like, solemn trust. And especially with these dreams, and again, the, like, second dream, and we don't even know if these are the only two dreams that he ever had where this, like, was an idea. But I think I would like to say he, he had faith, um, or at least I would have kept the faith uh, with, with all of that, because it, if something's presented to you multiple times, it's easier to hold on to. So, I, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a fair sentiment. And, and truth be told, I don't think we don't really get an insight mm-hmm. into what, what he was feeling. But I think sometimes we do look at these, these Old Testament figures and we hold them at such this high esteem. But if we look even Abraham, he actually regularly would basically give his wife away to other people because he didn't trust God. He didn't trust the promise that God made for him. And there are lots of things. That's why Ish, Ishmael is even born is because he didn't trust God and, and the same thing. So, so I have to wonder if, even though that repetition existed, I, I do wonder which, which one it was, if it was like, yeah, I'm going to stay dedicated to this, or if it was, uh, I don't know, I, I have to think at some point the humanity kicks in and you're like, yeah. all right, <laughs> how is this going to, maybe not even like, is this going to happen, but how could it possibly happen at this point? Um, and, and yeah, I, I think the, that that parallel, though, between, it, it seems like there's more trust, particularly as we read these stories of the gospel, and I wonder how much of that is from more trust because especially the cultures then you believed in god you believed in many gods in most cases and so there was never this question of does god exist which i think we face today a lot more than they did um so it could have been or was it more of that humanity did they also doubt too and that's something i would love to love to know but i you know we got we got what we get um and so 
now, you know, things are so different from when Joseph, you know, he had his dreams and, and he interpreted a lot of dreams. We know his story doesn't end here. He goes on and we do know that God keeps that promise. We do know that he becomes this big figure in, in Egypt. But how do we kind of react to the dreams that God gives us today? And what struggles do we face when we realize them? I think we hear a lot less of the God, the, the God-sized dreams. Yeah. Um, like, I would... And there's, like, different qualifications for, like, what it means for, like, God to give us a dream. Um, I think th that, in a way, this was a God-sized dream that mm -hmm. we looked at. Um, I would like agree. When, when we all started everything and looking at what it means to, like, have a new service where different things happen than a normal just somebody getting up and preaching. Yeah. Um, was kind of the, the dream that we started to look at. And so it was a little bit it's a little bit harder to follow through, mm -hmm. especially when it's like a God sized dream because he, he will provide, mm -hmm. but we have to, we have to start. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important to look at when you look at a God sized dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is determining where it's coming from. Cause if mm -hmm. you don't know God's voice, you're not going to know Absolutely. where it's coming from. And we're obviously easily deceived and mm -hmm. Satan likes to plant lies. And I think dreams are a powerful way of that happening. So you got to be kind of careful and make sure you know God's voice, know his mm -hmm. word to be able to differentiate between who's really speaking. Absolutely. We all know God's not going to tell us to do something that's life threatening or that's going to harm others or ourselves. So that's, that's a big thing to look for when you're trying mm -hmm. to determine your dreams and if God's calling you for something. Absolutely. And I think, um, especially as we look at this story of Joseph, we realize that being called to a dream doesn't mean it's magically just going to work out right away, mm -hmm. right? It's that, as Andy indicated, it's that mixture of the divine with humanity, right? It's where we meet each other. The divine's willing to be there, but we have to step up too. It's not. Um, and, I, and I think as we continue through, and we'll be studying Joseph's story for the most of the rest of the summer, I believe, um, you'll get to hear some of his ups and downs. And that it's not smooth sailing, you know, God-sized dreams, when you, when you can identify God's voice and when you really stay true to that, you can still hit a ton of struggles. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's okay, that's part of the process. But God does provide in the end. And so, as we have gone quite over our time today, but I really appreciate both of you being here mm -hmm. and again... Andy, we will miss you. Gabe, welcome, like, three weeks after you got here. Oh, yeah. You know, it's we, better late than never, right? Yeah, exactly. It's big yeah. happens. Yep. Uh, so our challenge question to everyone who is watching is, what are the God-sized dreams that you have been called to? And along with that, what are the God-sized dreams you believe that this church, Midland First United Methodist Church, has been called to? And we'd love for you to leave a comment and let us know what are those dreams that, that you feel that God has laid upon your heart. So please uh, join me in prayer once again as we prepare for the praise part of our service. Dear God, we thank you that you give us each a story to tell. God, we ask that you, you be the author of every part of our story and help us to see that, that you lay those dreams on our hearts for a reason. Even when we face struggles, that doesn't mean that, that you've failed. It just means the story's not over yet. And God, as we prepare to praise and worship you and in awe and wonder, we just ask that you, you ready our hearts to be in your presence and to celebrate you all here together. In your name we pray. Amen.
thought that I was too far gone for everything I've done wrong. Yeah, I'm the one who dug this grave, but you called my name. You called my name. I thought that I was too far gone for everything I've done. You call.